Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Dragon Age Inquisition. In the last episode, we finished up the Old Graves, and the next episode was going to be a codex episode. So that's exactly what's happening right now. We're going to go... Go, 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 go. <laughs> we are going to go straight into characters. Excuse me, I have a cold. My nose is stuffy. Sometimes I can't hear myself talk. <laughs> We're going to go into characters. What's a world worth saving without the colorful characters who call it home? This is everything essential about key players helping or hindering the Inquisition. Hmm. Briala. Let's see a picture. Show image. Interesting. Humble little image. Cool background. Author. Watch out for the elves of the Palum Troll. Almost no one notices they're even present. A servant scrubbing floors, a waiter filling glasses, undergardeners weeding the border, maids and valets dressing nobles. There's no room. Out over alley, so private you can't find them. And they're watching. The rumor you've heard of some of the masterminds leading the elves is not a rumor. I have reports that this Briala was Selene's personal spy and assassin, a bard of unusual skill. skill. <laughs> Who she's working for now, we cannot confirm. Say nothing, they will hear you. Part of a calm unique, intercepted by Inquisition agents, other unknown. Well, obviously, I'm having a weird time reading today. I took a great time to read. Calpurnia! I have never heard of Calpurnia before I joined the Venatori. To venture circles have no record of a mage of that name, so I thought her perhaps a magister from one of the old houses who took a false title. Calpurnia appears to have no background at all, however, and offers no hints to her past. She is too shrewd to flatter, even if she did not spend half her hours training as her master's star pupil should. I cannot openly challenge her, but one is a fair mistress to her followers, and her passion to restore the Imperium's glory strengthens their hearts and loyalty. Besides, her spells blister with power. Only a fool would try to undermine Calpurnia by force. We will require a lighter touch. Note from Marconius Pelinix, Ben Hasrath agent to the Canary. Dated several days before his mysterious death by fire. Oh shit. Oh, she's flattered. Oh, that's the chick that was right next to her. Alright. Same for Cole. Okay. His name is Cole. They're added. He's not that old, perhaps 20 years, no more. He has blonde hair. That hangs in front of his eyes. He wears dirty leathers. Perhaps the only clothes he owns. He was there when he found Reese in the Templar crypt. But you couldn't see him. Nobody can. And those who do forget them, just like you are right now. Remember the dream. A letter allegedly written by former Knight Captain Evangeline de Brassard. Found in this fire in the aftermath of the Mage Uprising. Inquisitor, if you believe that this cold truly wishes to help the Inquisition and can be trusted to do so safely, I am willing to give him a chance to prove himself. As Solus insists that he is a spirit made manifest in the form of a young man, not a demon possessing an unwilling victim, I can see that he may not be malicious. Nevertheless, Cole's abilities concern me. I would ask Leliana to have him watch, but most of Skyhold seems unable to see this spirit, or remember him, even if informed of his existence. The servants complain of odd occurrences, items mislaid or moved to strange locations, but have thus far been unable to see or remember the person responsible. Such actions appear harmless thus far, but I remain vigilant. Sandra. Cole appreciates the Inquisition helping those who are hurting and in need. Okay. Grievous! Oh god. It's a nice picture. What is it? So many things. Let me tell you what I know about the Seven. Those demented magisters said to have entered the Golden City long ago. Each was a high priest to one of the old gods. Each came to the ritual shrouded in secrecy, hiding their true name even from each other. They were competitors, you see. The old gods told them they would break into the Golden City and usurp the Maker's throne, but only one of them could sit on that throne. Each assumed a title related to their role in casting the ritual. Some texts claim they had a leader, the high priest of Dumont, Dumont called Corypheus. He did not rule this group, but instead conducted it, coordinating their groups to achieve a magical feat never since replicated. They breached the Fade, walked physically in dreams, and changed our world forever. Perhaps these seven were the first dark spawn, cursed by the Maker, as the chant of light tells us. Perhaps not. One would think these magisters long dead, but there are whispers that this is not so. Think, if you will, what might become of the minds of such beings, corrupted by the blood, cast down from prideful folly, simmering in the resentment of darkness for over a thousand years. Where would such men live? To know who knows what of them. For someone must, if whispers persist. What secrets do they yet hold? What will we do should any one of them return to the light? With luck, these are questions we will never have to answer. When questioning the champ, I magister Vivius and Okay. Dorian Pallas, only child and heir presumptuous to the senatorial seat of Magister Howard Pallas, 
Dory comes from a prestigious line of mages prominent in the coastal provincial city of Kalinas since the late Exalted Age. At that time, the Imperium was recovering from a failed Exalted function of Earth Blight. Gideon Pond, this arose as the voice of reason within the Magisterium. His block of allies convinced the Imperium not to descend upon the weakened south to extend a band of reconciliation to those who had once sought their destruction. That house Pavis remained standing even after Magister Gideon was tried for treason in the testament to the power he built, and, as Dorian himself would claim, an excellent example of how inter internecine politics <laughs> intervention can bring low even the brightest star. Lesson he says one should never forget. Okay. Did I look at this picture? It's his card. It's his card. Alright, who's this? I press Celine Valmont. That's not really flattering. Pictures, but okay. My dear Viscount, I congratulate you on securing an invitation to appear at court. Allow me to represent you. Allow me to present you with these three words of advice as a gift. Don't underestimate Celine. You must not mistake her reputation as a diplomat and peacemaker to mean she avoids conflict. Dozens of her enemies littered to the bottom of the harbor in Valvaro. Negotiation did not send them. She is as shrewd and ambitious as her grandfather Judicare the first, but unlike him, she knows how to handle the nobility. She built the University of Orlais, the most vehemently, 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 <laughs> I can't read today, opposed to project nor Elysian history, because she knew how to win the support she needed to overcome even her bitterest rivals. She can keep a pet apostate in front of the Chantry, because even the divine fears her influence. Do enjoy your visit to the palace. Sincerely, Duke Germain. Grand Duchess Florian de Chalons. Your Grace, you requested the swiftest, surest method of getting a message to Grand Duke Gaspard, so I have arranged for you to meet with his sister, Grand Duchess Florian de Chalons. While she is the la least account among the current heirs to the Elysian throne, the connection to her brother is extremely close. Gaspard will listen to anything she says. Be persuasive. And she has the cooler picture of Celine. Grand Duke Gaspard de Chalons. Lady Montalon, I can offer no apology for my nephew's behavior the other night. Gaspard has never betrayed any interest in following my advice. In truth, everything he said to you at your dinner party, he also said to me. His resentment at being deprived of the throne has festered for some time, and he was never one to accept defeat gracefully. I would take Gaspard's threats of war seriously. I do not believe my nephew knows how to resolve problems through the use of anything but steel. If his record on the battlefield is any indication, he is quite adept at doing so. I shall be increasing my personal guard directly. Sincerely, Duke Gratia. Run Enchanta Fiona. Oh, that's a cute hedgehog. I like it. <laughs> Hero of Ooh, The Hero of Ferelden was the daughter of Bryce Cousin, Terra of Ivor. When all Rendon House versus attacked Castle Cousin and murdered most of the Cousin family, the hero escaped to the safety of his greyborn High Commander Duncan, who then recruited her to the order. After defeating the Arshim and ending the fifth flight, the hero of Ferelden was wed to King Alistair and crowned Queen of Ferelden. She and the king ruled the country together until she disappeared several years later. The current world are unknown. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Magister Garion Alexius. Okay, that's a, that's a medicine thing. Lords and ladies of the Magisterium. Before we vote on the budget for this latest measure against the Kumari, I would ask that we take a moment to consider the state of our institutions of higher learning. Mr. Goldman Rathis is more than 10,000 years old. Darinius of the Dreamer himself was born within those walls. Darinius? Yeah, I'll go with it. <laughs> he continues to be a source of the wisdom and guidance for the best and brightest of the Imperial youth, yet it falls into disrepair. Magister Ararius has made her case several times for increased funding to the circles and as yet her appeals have gone unanswered. Magister Viren has spoken at length of the threat of the Oxmen in the North, a tide of brutality that we alone hold her back. Let me add this. How shall we defeat the Kanari? How have we held back their advance all these long years without support from the other nations of Thetis? You know the answer. Magic. It is our magic that holds the beast at bay. And through the ingenuity of our magic, we will drive them from our shores forever. My friends and colleagues, this is the battle we prepare for. The princesses are apprentices, sons, and daughters to face. They need the resources to discover new magic, new techniques that can lend us an advantage in this endless war. They cannot do this while troops crumble over their heads. Prepare the circles, that the Imperium's future be more than slow decline to the marching steps of legions. And addressed by Magister Alexius the Magisterium, taken from the official minutes, 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 whatever, <laughs> 939 30.
Mars in it. Ooh, that's diamond to the fire. That's awesome. Monsieur, I too am concerned about this new advisor to the Imperial Court. If Celine is truly curious about magic, why not turn to Madame the Fair with her questions? Why not seek why seek out this dark haired apostate from Ferrari? Why bring the woman here? After a great deal of surveillance, I can reassure you somewhat. I do not believe this Morgan has our interests in Sorcerer. There is no way to be certain, of course, but the witch and Celine argue often. But if Morgan tells Celine something unpleasant, she will avoid the witch for months before curiosity draws her back. Morgan has an interest in ancient things, magic from a time before the Chantry even existed, and it is this pursuit that intrigues Selene. Morgan can answer questions that the Madame de Ferrer either could not or would not. Whether any pertain to blood magic or other forbidden things, that I can only suspect. Three of my spies disappeared after attempting to breach the spells protecting the woman's laboratory in the depths of the palace. I would raise a fuss, but then my effort would be revealed, even though I doubt I am alone. The entire court is consumed with curiosity, and the more Selene keeps her in the sidelines, the more we all wish to know. Our Empress plays little with fire. Or, oh, wait, she does play with fire. Our Empress plays with fire, not me. Considering she has yet to find herself a husband to solidify the future of her dynasty, these dealings with the apostate are one more nail in her cuff. Yours and trust, Madame de Carmel. I get so easy. Sir Stroud. Ah, oh, Stroud. Born the youngest son of a minor noble family in the fields of this lane, Jean Marc Stroud. Jean Marc, that's his freaking first name. <laughs> had just finished training at the Academy des Chevaliers when he received word that his family had been killed. Oh no, ostensibly by bandits. In reality, they were victims of the Allegiant Great Game. Sir Stroud's plan to find his family's murderers was cut short when the Great Warden Clarell recruited Stroud on the advice of the Academy trainers. He did not wish to see a promising young chevalier throw his life away in fruitless pursuit of vengeance. Unable to refuse such a request honorably, Sir Stroud joined the Wardens and left his old life behind. Warden Stroud has served the Great Wardens with honor for decades. He is regarded as one of the finest swordsmen in the Order, combining the study of the Academy with years of fighting Darkspawn alongside Doris and the Duke Rose. Warden Commander Calurel has asked past him with recruiting and training new Wardens. Most young Warden warriors owe their skill to Stroud's mentorship. Oh god, no. Oh no. Stroud prefers to travel in the free marches rather than all land, where his family history could cause him to become caught up in the game, leading to the accusations of political interference among wardens. He also has no strong opinions regarding mages or templars, although he believes both groups wrong to turn their back on the chantry, which Stroud holds in some esteem. The intelligence report delivered to the leader. A champion of Crystal. That doesn't look like a hawk. <laughs> it looks like a hawk, but not hawk. <laughs> I've heard the name hawk on several lips this week. Many of us blame the champion for the events in Kirkwall, which sparked a war and hurled all Thalys into chaos. But can we truly fault hawk for what she did? Here was a poor refugee from Pharrell that began with a free march to split in the blight. Coming from a family of apostates, Hawk must expect her life hiding from Templars. Hearing about the abuses to which mages under the care of the Circle were subjected. Make no mistake, they were abuses. We will never find a peaceful solution to this conflict until we admit that we are partially responsible. Imagine how it must have been for Hawk when she rose to prominence for her role in ending the threat of 934. From refugee to champion of football, Hawk's position gave her power and influence. Nothing that could touch her. But although the champion of Kirkwall walked free, there were major gallows who did not. The thought was to work with. Are the champion's actions during the mage uprising so hard to understand, given all I have said? Following the destruction of the Chantry, Knight Commander Meredith invoked the right of annulment and called for the execution of every mage in Kirkwall. It was not right. Another injustice added to an already link. Hawk knew it and stood against her. She put herself between the Templars and the mages. They sought to destroy it and became a legend. Even though she later disappeared, fleeing Kirkwall and the Chantry's justice, what happened in Kirkwall that day changed Thetis forever. By defying Meredith in the Order, Hawk became a beacon for the Mage Rebellion that gave the Mages hope and rallied them. They fought back, and here we now stand on the eve of the Divine Conclave, seeking peace before the Rebellion destroys itself. Knight Commander Marteau of Monsignor, speaking to Templars attending the Divine Conclave. Alright. 
one commander Clara populated only by dark slot. I understand as well as you're concerned that I'm a mage living outside the confines of the circle. I've been informed that you saw magic ill used by apostates at Redcliffe. You have my sympathy in this, but not my apology. You make yourself fit to give me the gift of magic, along with a temperament better suited to battle than quiet meditation. I left the circle legally. The Grey Wardens gave me a chance to use my abilities to defend our land. I know apostate. My first interest, Arl Tegan, indeed my only interest, is to see the world protected from the blight. I may be warden commander of all day, but I'm not really in the heart. I'm a Grey Warden and nothing more. I will defend this land from the horrors you cannot even imagine. My oath comes before political ambition, before concerns about the rights of mages. It will one day become my, come before my own survival. I hope to hear from you soon. Yours, one commander, Clarel de Chancel. Oh. Interesting, congratulations. Ooh, armor blessing. Blessed by the vine in the spring, I shall not fear the winter sting. Arbor Blessing is a useful vine that is notoriously difficult to cultivate, as if it had a mind of its own. The wind often carries its minuscule seeds for great distances from the parent plant. It is hard to say what causes the seeds to sprout once they land. However, it has long been believed that comfort and abundance follow where the Arbor Blessing goes. Perhaps the vine only chooses conditions that promote rich harvest from domesticated flora. Therefore, see Arbor Blessing in spring, and we shall not grow hungry in winter. Excerpt in the botanic compendium by Alice Arcadia. Valencia, Valencia. Should be Arcadia, it sounds cool. Death fruit. Death fruit has been used in magic and potion making for centuries. It's a fragile looking plant with a thin stalk and purple flowers, which fruits once a year, developing bright red fleshy pods that cause disorientation and dizziness or congestion. There are two varieties. The more common Arcanist death fruit was the first found by Archon the Great, Hadrianus, Hadrianus, Hadrianus. When he discovered it growing on several dead slaves. The other, Lunatic's death rate, is more closely associated with the story of the courtesan Melusine, who sought revenge on the power of the Magister and his family. She harvested the plant, baked it into small pies for the Magister's banquet, and presented them to the Magister at the banquet. All the guests were seized by the terrifying hallucinations after eating the pies, and then they tore each other to pieces. Tore each other to pieces? Oh my god, can I talk? Excerpt from the Botanical Compendium by Inez Rancia, Bonus. And with the Wither Stock, Elodia. I said you could take a few components for your personal use. <laughs> I'm certain I didn't say you could empty our stores. Enchanter Inez looked like she was shitting hog nuts when she dozed. Do you know what? how long it took to know, collect that Wither Stock? I know what you're doing with it. No one needs that many important drugs. I'm locking the chest. Find your own Wither Stock. Perhaps you, Fred, fair could try to stick to your own quarters. <laughs> Note written by Princess Verlene of From Circle, Maker of Vera. That is not what's going on. All the bit of stuff in the chest was dried anyway, and you know it's only a facia, so as a preventative and the sap is fresh. I'm more interested in its effects on the mind when combined with certain other plants. Inez knows all about it. Just ask her. She probably forgot that I already told her all that. And please, Fern, Fair and I are more able to amuse ourselves without resorting to tidal dippers, sir. Maybe she got out of the botanical section and looked at other books. Princess Lady's reply. Stuff. Oops. Great charts. Arcane horror. Okay. Upon ascending to the second floor of the tower, a gruesome slight greenness, a ragged collection of bones wearing the robes of one of the senior enchanters I had known of the and watched her raise countless apprentices, and now she was a mere puppet for some demon. Transcribed from a tale told by a Templar and Antiva City. So arcane horrors are mages. Yes, I do. August Ram. August Ram. Surely whoever named it Ram had never seen it. More common cousin. With slender legs and sleek eyed give the animal the grace of a heart or a hollow. Its curved horn is spiraled back over its delicate ears, twitching at the slightest rustle of grass. When startled, speed is the August Ram's only defense. It's the hunter. It's difficult to sneak up on these shy and wary creatures, but I have been here for so long and shown such mild behavior that I gain their trust. The rams graze peacefully, the stones throw from me, my sketching easel as I write this, thinking no more of me than a rock in the field or a flower in the grass. I just wish the rotten things would stop trying to eat my canvases whenever I leave camp. From the diary of Tillendal Lemelin, noted painter of wildlife and portraits of the Arlesian Court. Behemoth. Ugh. We could have held off a battering ram, but the he behemoth, it took the gate off at the hinges. 
It screamed. Not a roar, a growl, a scream, all rage and pain. As I drew my blade, all I could think was there's a Templar in there. Somewhere in that thing was a brother or sister of the Order. Every fiber of my soul was crying out to them. But whoever it might have been, whoever son or daughter, they were lost to us, swallowed by the corruption and lies. I helped the only way I could, the only way any of us can. We must end their suffering. And make a willing, we must try to remember them as they were. In the reports of Night Captain Vidya, tactical considerations for the information. That's Katie. Alright. Ronto! There are only two things a noble will step aside for paragons, paragons and angry Brontos. The Dwarven City. The Dwarven Shaper originally bred this hulking beast as a beast of burden, a food source, the rough equivalent of a surface with oxen and cows. Some version of the Bronto have even been developed as dwarven mounts, valued more for sure footedness and stamina than speed. While present in Orzammar in large numbers, some Brontos still exist in packs in the deep roads, having returned to a wild state after the fall of the dwarven kingdoms. They require remarkably little sustenance, absorbing nutrients from water, fungus, and even rocks, hence the rock liquor appellation many dwarves used to describe Brontos. It exists primarily in dwarven state and self invoked. An angry charging Bronto is considered a rather dangerous opponent from tales of Beneath the Earth by Pedagogy. Beneath the Earth, huh? That's different than Charles of the Chantry's calling. Corpse. In most corners of Thetis, funeral rites include burning or dismembering the dead to prevent them from becoming hosts for demons. But not everyone gets the proper burial. It is not unheard of for the dead to be thrown from mass graves in the aftermath of a battle or execution almost asking for some demon to claim the corpses. From the On the Veil, Spirits and Demons by Enchantra Mujima. Research damage against undead? Oh, Buffalo. They said the mages were coming to Brentwood. We had to leave or be caught in the middle of their war. The guy said that it would be safe in dinner. We left as soon as we could, but the little ones could barely walk a mile. I was about to turn back when Guy saw a herd of wild ruffalo passing through the hills, he said. Well, how different can they be from horses, or pointers? Well, with those horns, I was afraid and told Guy not to go, but he said we had no choice. Guy said he would catch up to us, that we should continue on. We kissed goodbye, and then he left the children, and I keep walking. One day passed two and three, and I knew my heart was dead. I almost gave up one morning, I was fetching water from the river, and I thought how easy it would be. They would just slip away, and I would follow them. No more pain, no more fear. As I searched for a courage, I heard a crashing through the underground bears. I thought were a bear, but instead it was a giant beast with a pelt of blue berry and bleeding black horns, and riding it. Muscled back was my guy. The ruffalo was enormous, but gentle as a doe. The children called him Bluebell. I never told him what I almost came to that day. Wow. Jerry found a refugee tent in the middle of That's hardcore. <laughs> ah, fear. Imagine, if you will, the most basic impulses possessed by mankind. Rage, hunger, perhaps the most primal is fear. Even the youngest of us understands this concept, and the raw power that drives almost all else. A demon that preys upon fear is not the most sophisticated sort of creature. They mimic forms they see in the nightmares and portals, hoping to elicit the response they crave. Some of these demons, however, stumble upon terrors that are much more deeply rooted. Fears of the future, chaos, disorder, a failure. This sort of demon develops a far more refined palate, attacking the physique of the psyche of their target, rather than seeking a simple scare. Beware the fear demon that gorges upon the terror of not only a single nightmare, of a nation, for it will grow to such a size that it dominates the fade. In a lecture by the renowned Templar at Sir Hayward. That sounds like a threat. A giant fear demon? Uh, a gurgit. In the chant of light, claims that the Maker made us, and on our folly, we think ourselves blessed by such fact. The fact it is, for her in my seeking, I found only base illusions, the better for being torn down and mocked. As inadequate by the harsh light of reason. But as an exercise, let us say that it is true, that the Maker made us. I have seen the Gurgit basking in a slanted shaft of sunlight in the Penumbra Canyon, his putrescent tongue scenting the rancid air of the nameless and unnameable swamp, swishing the uncaring grass of the plains with his passage. It is some cousin of the river, but bereft of the savage ferocity for which the latter is praised and hunted by Orlesian nobles. His thick-lidded eyes stare witlessly, and his jaw hangs agape. It is not befuddled or frustrated by its want of reason, but perfectly content, a drooling idiot. With pallid belly stretches and distends, 
disdaining all of reason, when it gorges itself upon its prey. I have seen such a lowly beast swallow a chevalier whole, the great and shining warrior taken by surprise in the dull grass, his silver white armor gleaming as the grip a hinges jaw to draw the chevalier in. Across its belly I saw the kicks and struggles were frenzied, and then still, when the idiot beast settled into a happy torpor, the ruined armor of the noble chevalier rolled among the girded its horror suffered as little. Say that it is true that the Maker made us, but what if he made us for food? What if the grand purpose of our searching existence is to stretch the belly of a beast that slinks through the tall grass? What if there is a single unbending purpose, and in it we are cattle to feed the witless leviathans a slumber unseen beneath us? From an anatomy of various terrible beasts by Baron Harvard Pierre the Immortal Maker makes us check behind him for gurgits at all times, master. He also carries a very short stick. Footnote in the margins of the manuscript by Baron Scribe Dudwick. A hollow. The first thing you, under, you must understand about the hollow is that they are not our servants. They are not our pets. They are our brothers and sisters. Remember that Gilanon was the first hollow, mother of them all. He was the headdress of the people. Without the hollow, there would be no Dalish. The second thing you must understand about the hollow is that you cannot force a hollow to do something against her will. I have heard tales of Shemlin who come across herds and attempt to capture the hollow using ropes and bridles. Many Shemlin have died and paled on horns as a result of this foolishness. Never forget that the hollow once wore our knights into battle. The fierce blood of a warrior still runs through her veins, and she would sooner fight to the death than to meet herself. Like the Dalish, the hollow a proud. The hollow knows who she is, and will not tolerate no being that tells her that she is this. How then do we harness them to the arrows? How do we ride them or strap our packs to them? Well, how do you get a brother or sister or friend to do you a favor? Simple, isn't it? You ask. If you have a hollow's trust, she will give you her blessing. But strike you that he would never think to ask for a hollow's friendship. But then, if her shams and respect nothing, Adara, hollow tender of the Ralafarian clan, and do her apprentice. Adari. Oh, I knew. The specimen was fresh, killed only a few hours ago by a troop of chevaliers patrolling outside the city. The captain told me in a strange and quickly sickly voice that a group of Red Templars had descended upon him and his men and massacred them. I gave him my condolences, but he seemed not to hear me. The one in my slab was fast, the captain muttered. Mr. Dumbler ran his bolt, suggested. Imagine my nausea when I opened up the creature and saw the red valerian infused through the bones, overgrowing, overgrowing its lungs and spread like a fungus into the brain. As I watched, the red crystal pulsed and spread the smallest fraction of an inch deeper into the flesh of the corpse. Blood drained out of the surrounding tissue as if the valerian itself were feeding on it. I have ordered my sister to wear masks and gloves while burning the body. Posterity, forgive me, I want no truck with the forces in that thing. From the diary of Professor Offeret, naturalist studying at the University of Valor. Snowflare. Bragging about how he was going to land it. Picked up someone new, called himself Marcher, and it offered three early royals to travel alongside Celestine. Bending both knees, he saw the bows, thought would be protection. Didn't think we might turn weapons on him ourselves. Make her scrapes by the time we hit Leeds, I wanted to. Little shit couldn't stop bragging about how he was going to be a tutor for some high lord's son. Everything out of his mouth was my lord sick, silk knickers this and my lord silk, silk knickers that. Showed us a little painting of my lord silk knickers and his lady. My lord I wanted to punch, but the rump on my lady I meant to tutor that. And then when going through the dales, we see one of those long nosed pigs with the stump legs. It's just crossing that highway, dragging its stupid belly along the ground as they do. Bless the maker and all. But he was deep in his holy golden cups the day he made that thing. Anyway, I turned to Lockie and said, Hey, it's one of them snufflers. Marchand starts in with a goop of Lockie and me to look at him. Snuffler, he says. He like he just caught me naked with his lady mother. Non tuto stair snuffler. Because Snuffler just isn't fancy enough for Oli. So I say it like he does. Snuffler. Can't keep a straight face. Marchand goes on red like a virgin with skirts blown up. Good old Lucky. Lockie, he just shoots up the thing with an arrow while it's snuffling its way across the road. That was dead and we can call it dead, he says. That was that. From the hunting log of Care of West Hill, they did 17 souls. That's how that's that. That's right.
we've read about. What did I miss? What am I missing? It must be in a corner where I can't see it. Super bright. What did I not read, man? What did I not read, man? 